Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's edition of the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group Advanced DBA Subgroup. We are going to talk about deleting lots of rows from production systems, probably rows that Anders inserted. So it makes sense that he would uh, know how to remove them. So before I get started and hand it over to Jared, we will talk very briefly about Data Architecture Day coming up on Saturday, May 16th. This is a 13 hour Twitch marathon covering topics of data architecture interest. So if you wanna get the schedule for that, go to meetup.com slash tripass, check for data architecture day. That'll give you a link to the schedule. It'll give you a link to sign up so that you remember to show up on a sun or Saturday morning. Don't show up on Sunday morning because I probably won't be streaming Sunday morning. So with that, let's go over to our war correspondent, Jared Poche. He's got the old well, 1990s you, CNN uh, overcast voice, thanks to having to dial in. <laughs> oh, I haven't been practicing my overcast voice, but uh, all right. Well, thank you. Um, so this is a talk that I wrote recently that has been based on uh, work I've been doing uh, a lot for the last year and based on some things I've blogged uh, in the last several months. And um, it's just been a... We, the talk is not exclusively about deleting data. It's a lot about taking large operations and breaking them out into much smaller operations that are a lot less disruptive. But a lot of this for me has been doing uh, tuning a bunch of garbage collection processes over the last year, which has had really good benefits for us. We have terabytes less data as a result. So uh, in talking about batching major operations and some of the mechanics we're going to go through, uh, this has an impact on a lot of different things. Uh, garbage collection processes, uh, data archival, um, it can be useful for backfilling new columns if you don't want to have the entire table being locked while you're creating it. Um, it's also useful if you're um, managing privately, uh, personally identifiable information. So if you're trying to anonymize or obfuscate data, um, it can be very useful to take this approach and um, and take a, potentially a, a need to anonymize a large amount of data and do it quickly and efficiently in really small bytes. This can also be useful, um, and I'm using it, uh, kind of the same ideas to batch a really large, uh, report that we run very, very often against our OLTP databases. And I'm taking that and breaking it up into much more manageable pieces and keeping the performance good. Um, so to get into it, uh, one of, we need to talk about a couple of mechanics first, and I'm going to show, start off with some simple examples. But a lot of this about um, taking large operations and making them into something uh, more bite-sized comes back to using the top operator, but getting things lined up so that we can have the performance that we expect to have from that operation. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to show you what a top plan should look like. We're going to go through some common caveats uh, being sorts and uh, conflicting criteria. And uh, we'll talk about uh, a bit about just how um, normal queries operate. So. Here we are. Um, I've got a few simple examples lined up. This is not going to take long. So I'm using the Worldwide Importers database, and I'll make sure that the scripts I'm using for this, if anybody's interested, I'll make sure we get them somewhere where people can uh, get at them. So here's a simple example based on the order lines table. Um, I've got a where clause. I'm just trying to return top 100 rows uh, based on a couple of criteria on the order line ID and the unit price. So let's take a look at this. And this is kind of what I expect to see. This is the good case. This is what I want my execution plan to look like. We're doing an index seek. Um, are you guys able to see everything well? Okay. <laughs> um, we're doing right, an index seek. I was on mute. Um, yes, that actually, since you zoomed in on the execution plan, makes it look fantastic. Okay. Uh, we're returning 100 rows from our clustered index seek operation. If I mouse over it, I can see that we actually read more than that. But of course, we're filtering things based on the price and based on the line ID. But we return uh, 100 uh, lines from this operation. It goes to the top, and that shuts down uh, the operation. So one of the things, th there's two ideas that came that I, I picked up on last year from having uh, Grant Fritchie, of all people, come to Channel Advisor and spend the day with us. And we were talking about a number of topics. We were talking about query store, and we talked about some performance things. 
um, one of the things he talked about was how, was kind of how uh, queries flow, and it was a little bit turned on its head from what I from what I understood or expected. And my thinking had always been in how the data flows, and it flows upwards from kind of the leaf nodes, the the index seek in this case, up towards the select operation. But part of what he was discussing is how in is kind of how the intelligence of this works, and it can be useful for us here. So I'm going to go through it real quick. And the idea is that when we're running this query, the select operation is going to start off, and um, the select operation, the select operator, kind of drives everything. And what it does is it says to the operator underneath it, "Hey, you, give me a row." And so that operator is going to go off and do whatever it does, provide a row to the select operator. At which point the select operator says, "Okay, now give me another row." And so things are being driven from the top end from where the select operator is. Um, the top operator is important to this, though, because the way it operates is it's asking for rows from the items underneath it, it, underneath it in this case, just our clustered index seek. But the top operator is going to shut down once it's actually received 100 rows or once the seek underneath it says, I've got no more to offer you. So, But this, again, is just a simple example of how I expect things to go. Um, here's a slightly more complicated example. Um, I'm returning another field from the order lines table. So in our execution plan, we're actually having to do a, a key lookup on order lines. So we're still just using the same table, but we've got uh, two operations going on here actually getting data. You can see we return 149 rows from our first index seek, but we only return 100 from our key lookup. We're doing some additional filtering here. We're filtering based on the quantity in the predicate on the key lookup operation. So we're not done filtering until we hit that point. But you can see from there, we return 100 rows. We return that up through the nested loops. And we're not doing any extra necessary work. We're not looking through everything on the table. We told it to give us 100 rows. And we're doing as little work as we have to to complete that operation. Now, we've got a couple things that can go sideways on us and cause our top operator uh, to not nail things down as quickly as we would like. So here's another example. Um, returning a couple more columns, I'm still, I'm actually joining the orders table and the order lines table. I've, I've got a little hint here because sometimes SQL Server decides to come up with more curious plans. But this is kind of what I expected again. So here we're returning almost 5,000 rows. Now our filter, we're filtering for order IDs less than 5,000 to that extent. And we're also filtering on quantity. But we're turning 5,000 rows here and 900 here, it seems like things are kind of going sideways. Uh, part of what's going on is we're using a hash match operator. The hash match um, is a blocking operator. We're going to talk more about this. This is one of the two important concepts. Um, it's a blocking operator. It doesn't, it doesn't flow through on a row by row basis like other operations do. So it interrupts uh, what we'd expect things to be doing here. Um, for the hash match to operate, it has to build a hashing table. For it to build a hashing table, it has to look up everything that matches the criteria of this first table. So if we look at our seek predicate, we're looking for everything with an order ID less than 5,000. Well, it's going and it's getting all 4,999 rows. It has to get all of them so that it can actually build the hash table. Uh, so the first part of this hash operation it's required that we go and uh, read everything that fulfills that criteria. Now, from there, we're passing stuff along to the order lines table. We're doing a clustered index scan here, which is also not great. Um, it's not hurting us that much now, but stick a pin in it because it'll be it can be much more of an issue later. So, we're actually returning 900 rows, which uh, which doesn't make a lot of sense. This one confused me a lot on the front end. I was looking at it. And I actually, uh, the first time I saw this, I thought to myself, wait a minute, what is our execution mode? Are we doing this in batch mode? No, we're actually still executing in row mode. If you're familiar with uh, batch mode execution, this is something that you will normally see on tables that have column store indexes. But in uh, SQL 2019, you'll start seeing this uh, on other tables as well without column store indexes. So here I was thinking maybe that was my problem, but I can see that this operation is done in row mode. But what uh, Kevin helped me figure out when I originally saw this is that the hash join is actually operating in batch mode. 
So we did a lot of extra work here because of the hash match itself. But because the hash operator is in batch mode, it doesn't actually tell the clustered index scan on order lines, give me a row. It says, give me 900 rows. So it passes all that information up to the hash match, which collects it, joins the two together, and then it passes on 100 rows to our, or it passes on all those rows, and the top operator just keeps the 100 that it wants. So this is an example of a thing to look out for. A, our hash match is, is kind of causing a problem here. Like I said, again, the clustered index scan will, will hurt us later, but we'll talk about that afterwards. One more example of kind of simple things that can go wrong here. So here I'm querying order lines again, same criteria. I've also got a order by clause here. And when you look at the execution plan, it's, oh, it's just a scan. And we're actually returning 11,000 rows here. So just from looking at that, at that point, you're like, okay, we're doing 100 times more work than we should be doing to do this operation. So this isn't efficient at all. Well, part of what's going on is, we don't actually have a top operator, we have a top end sort. So this is a sort and a top op operator at the same time. And sorts are also blocking operators. And when you think about it, it makes sense. You can't really, you, I, I can't sort this and give you the top 100 unless I go and look at all of the data that exists that fulfills this criteria. I have to go find everything that meets our predicate for this operation, which is also a clustered index scan. I have to go find everything that meets that criteria so that I can sort it and then give you the top 100. And if you look at this operation, we're returning 11,000 rows, but we're reading almost half a million. So this is doing a ton more work than we wanted to. So one of our caveats here is the fact that we have a where clause and our where clause is saying, okay, search our index is based on the order ID and the quantity. But we're sorting by the last edited win date. And so the two of these are kind of, you know, both of these you would want to have a good index to support either the, the order by or the where clause, but you can't use both of them at the same time. You're, you're basically telling the SQL uh, optimizer to look left and right at the same time. It can't do it. So what it's doing in this case is it's using an index that is going to, well, actually, it's just using the primary key index and it's reading everything and then it's sorting it afterwards. So we're doing a lot of work here. But if we either didn't have this order by clause or if our order and our where clause were kind of aligned, if they were based on the same column, we'd see a much different operation here. So this is a simple example. I just kind of wanted to show um, how the data flows and some of our common caveats. The, the two things you're most likely to, to see are sorts, maybe hash merges, but also the idea of, like I said, conflicting, cl conflicting criteria. To me, our order by wasn't really uh, aligned with what our query was trying to do. And that was a bit of a contrived example. So um, my first blog that I uh, have done in several years, um, I put out a few months back, and it was titled Getting to the Bottom of Top. And so I was talking about blocking operators and a number of things related to uh, doing a top that's, getting, that's completing your operation as efficiently as, as you can. Um, I've got a link here to that blog, and I've also got a link to uh, a blog, a, um, not a blog, but like a forum post about blocking operators because I was doing some searching around it. And honestly, uh, again, we had Grant Fritchie come in for the day, and he was speaking with us, and one of the things he was giving us an example of an execution plan. And he said, and it's doing this, that, the other. Oh, but we've got a sort here, and the sort is a blocking operator. And I was just flummoxed by this because I've never heard of somebody use the term blocking operator before. It's like I've, I've been working on SQL Server for 15, 15 years, and I, I, I've never heard someone say those two words before. And I was a little frustrated when I tried to look up more information about it because there's just not a lot of talking out there. And uh, the forum post I linked to is actually uh, Grant answering a question from somebody saying that there's no uh, definitive list uh, about what kind of operators are blocking operators, at which point uh, somebody else responded with a definitive list. So this gives a list of, uh, of, of uh, all the blocking operators that we, that we know of, 
And so I just wanted to make sure that you had that to refer back to. But sorts, hash matches, um, it's blocking on the first table that it accesses to build the hash table. Table spools, uh, anything that's a remote operation, scalar aggregates. Um, but that's good information and a good list to have at your disposal. So a lot of the work that I've been doing that has been trying to, to make these operations bite size and make them run really fast. A lot of what I've been doing for the last year is cleaning up garbage collection processes uh, to, with some really impressive results. But let me take you through an, a simple example of a garbage collection process. Pardon me a sec. So yeah, I had a simple example of a garbage collection process and then I realized uh, it was okay, but I can actually make a simpler one. So let's go to our simpler example. I'm using a table called vehicle temperature and it has 600,000 rows uh, in the wide world importers database. And what I'm trying to do here is uh, I've set, I want to have a batch size of 100 rows and I'm parameterizing it here. Um, that's useful later, especially if you're trying to do, say, a procedure that's going to do your garbage collection for you. But you want to be able, you want to keep it flexible and you want to be able to decide what your batch size is on the fly. So I set my batch size to be 100. I've created an index on this table that didn't already exist, and this is an in-memory table, so the syntax here is a little bit different. But um, I've got a delete operation with a top clause on it using my batch size, and I'm telling it to delete from the warehouse vehicle temperatures table based on the recorded wind date. I'm figuring if something's more than 100 days old, 180 days old, then we probably don't need it. And this is going to depend on whatever your data retention policy is for a given table or a given set of tables. And it will probably in no small part depend on whether you have a, uh, a uh, data retention policy or not. So in this case, I'm just going to run one batch, roll back the transaction afterwards so I cannot uh, mess up the environment I'm testing with. So let's look at this. And this is, again, what I'm really hoping to see. We've got an index seek. We've got a top operator. We're only returning 100 rows. It hits our top operator, then it hits our delete. So if I look at this, if I look at my index, we actually see that the actual number of rows read is 100. So that looks good. Everything about this looks great. The only thing that strikes me as weird at the moment is uh, we're doing an unclustered index seek. Somehow our seek operator has a higher cost than our table delete. Oh, it's an in-memory optimized table. That would explain that. That was really striking me as strange. but. Uh, to me, that's kind of sensible if we're deleting it from an in-memory table. So this is another example of how we expect things to go when things are going well for us. So by the way, when you're what if I was going to... When you're showing the tooltips, do you by chance have Zoom it? Do I have Zoom it? I am not sure if I have it. I don't think I have it on this machine. Okay. No. That's fine. That's fine. It's a little hard to see the tooltips okay. is all. Ah, the tooltips. Okay. Well, let I me... Mean, I'll see if there's anything I can do about that. Um, this is my, this is an example that's a little bit more flushed out because, okay, so we succeeded in deleting 100 rows. That table has 600,000 rows. Probably quite a few of them, if not all of them, would be deleted by this criteria. But what if I want my process to keep running and delete more data and I wanted to have it run for a reasonable amount of time and give it a window of, say, 30 seconds to operate in? Well, let me keep my batch size what it is, but I'm setting a duration and I'm setting it to 30 seconds. And I'm creating an end time. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, take now, add 180 seconds to it, and that's going to be our end time. So I've got a loop down below, where as long as now is before our end time, we'll keep doing another batch. So for the next 30 seconds, we'll keep trying to do batches of this operation where we delete 100, identify and delete 100 rows at a time. So if I run this, actually, hold on a second. Haha, <laughs> no. I don't think we want to sit here and watch that scroll for 30 seconds. Why don't we just, for the sake of the example, why don't we run it for five seconds? So I'm doing this in a transaction again so that I can roll it back afterwards. Um, I thought I told you to give me the execution plan. We'll try this one more time. Um, I also, and you'll see this, after my delete operation, I check to see what the row count is. And I'm saying if the row count is zero, well, then we don't need to keep looping for the next 30 seconds if there's nothing left to delete. But in this case, 
we do have whoop, hmm, this is going to be unhelpful. All right, here's our execution plan again. Um, again, we've got the same behavior. We're looking at 100 rows. We're deleting 100 rows. It's going through our top pause. There's no bottleneck here. Um, everything looks fine. I'm sorry, the tooltip is probably still a bit uh, tiny for you guys. I can see that the actual number of rows was 100 that we deleted here. The estimated number of rows to be read is really, really high, but I think that's just based purely off of the date and how many things would fall in that range. And it would look at a lot of data in this table if we weren't doing a top clause, probably be archiving all of it. Been talking really fast. Any questions so far? So are there any questions from chat? Uh, Solomon mentions the possibility of using the Magnifier app. I've never liked it myself, but it may help with showing those tooltips. Uh, I could go and download. Uh... You shouldn't have to download the Magnifier app. It should be built into Windows 10. OK, hold on a second. I'm not familiar with that. Let me see. Yeah, that one. Ooh, OK. Let me see then. Ah. OK, we'll see how that works. Um, so let me bring, see if I can bring back the execution plan again. So while he's doing that, if there are any questions so far from anybody in chat, now is a wonderful time for it. All right, then. Let's see if I can magnify this and hmm. Okay, I'm not terribly familiar with this. Okay, we can see at least some of the information when I mouse over this, but it's not helping massively here. Unless I can drag you down a little bit more. All right. I, I promise to get zoom it before I do this again. All right. I think that's that's definitely easier to read. Okay. Um, so everything's behaving well uh, in this case. So I'm going to move on to my next uh, couple of points. Um, there's a couple things that I've run across uh, in looking at some of our processes that weren't performing well that I would that I would put as our general baseline suggestions. One is to keep it simple. Um, I've seen a, I've seen processes that just have a lot a lot of extraneous logic and extra looping mechanisms. And um, one of the things that I saw earlier, uh, one of my uh, first examples, I had an order by clause on it. And I was, I was saying, we want to delete things based on this part of the where clause and that part of the where clause. But then I had an order by on it. And I, I, I actually blogged about something similar that I saw months back and I said, okay, it's essential, it, it's important that we delete this information, but it's really essential that we delete it all in the correct order. And, and in, that was something that I had seen uh, in a garbage collection process. I was like, why do we have the order by? We, we have a criteria for what we want to delete in our where clause. We have an index that supports it. Why are we sorting it? The sort is unnecessary. Let's get rid of that. In that case, that alone made a huge difference in our performance because now we don't have that sort operator. It's not blocking. We can go find our 100 rows and just move on. And it made a giant difference in that case. So keep it simple. If you're doing a garbage collection process, an archival process, if you're anonymizing data, any of this stuff where we're wanting it to just hit the top clause, get a few rows and move on, try to get rid of anything that's extraneous, anything that's unnecessary. Um, in one case, we were, a, we were looking at data based on an arbitrary ID value on the table that goes from zero to nine. And we were deciding, well, we don't want to delete all the table. We want to delete the zeros first. And it was, and, and the bias in that one was weird because um, it, it seemed like in some places we were we were deleting all the things with a zero for the ID, and then we were deleting the one. But like we might get to the three or the fours, but the but the sevens and the eights and the nines never got looked at. And this process was just staying behind in part because we were trying to subdivide and splice and and make things more complicated than it had to be. Um, that one actually had multiple levels to the while to the, uh, the the while looping inside this procedure. And so it was like, it was big O into the third. And it was just, 
there was a lot more going on than had to for us to find a few rows that we needed to delete and delete them. Um, transact as necessary. Um, you can really, in a lot of places, especially if you're deleting data, you can really ask yourself whether it's necessary to run a transaction at all. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, so, Jared, you... Okay. He is aware that he muted himself. Everything's good. <laughs> All right, I'm going to switch before you put in your phone number, Jared. Uh, to try pass promo. There. That way... Uh, Totally protected Jared's phone number. So as soon as he's back on the line, we're going to continue with presentation. Until then, I am going to vamp and talk about Data Architecture Day. I mean, it sounds like a great time to talk about Data Architecture Day. This Saturday, 13 hours of Twitch marathoning. He's still connecting. So any questions that I can answer while uh, we're trying to get our war correspondent back on the line? I am so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so Mike Lysanke. I had a asked, phone call coming in while I was talking and I was trying to kill the phone call and I apparently succeeded. Ah. All right, let's switch back. There we go. 13 hours? Yes, 13 hours. With some breaks, but 13 hours. Okay, so back to the presentation. Okay, my apologies for that. That was not a scheduled break. Um, so I was saying there are places that we may have transactions that are unnecessary, and uh, I have an example. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, bail when you can. In my last example, I had added a clause at the end of this while loop, and so it, it's controlled as is, and I'm normally I'm I'm telling it to run for up to 30 seconds. But obviously, you don't need to do that. If you if you run a delete and it comes back with zero rows, you don't need to run it for you know however many more times it can loop that in 30 seconds. If we see a if we see a circumstance that we can bail early, we should just bail and and spare ourselves a few CPU cycles. And if you're really paying attention, you'd say, well, wait a minute. If our row count is less than our batch size, that's actually a better one that'll stop us one loop sooner. If we're telling it to do top 100 rows, but we see that this runs one time and it deletes 99 rows, it's because there's not a 100th row to delete. And at that point, you're done. If it's anything lower than the batch size, it shut down the operation because there's nothing else to delete. So we can bail at that point. Um, one of the other things is consider the negative. So all of this I'm talking about, well, We'll, we'll do this, we'll look at the index, we'll get 100 rows, and then we'll stop. Well, what if we don't have 100 rows? What if there's not 100 rows left that fulfill the criteria? Well, this is where those scans that we were talking about in a couple of my earlier examples, that's when those index scans that you see would really come back and hurt. We got out of those quickly because we found 100, ro found 100 rows and then we moved on. Well, if there aren't 100 rows, we're going to keep looking to try to find the rest of them. And if we're doing a clustered index scan, we're going to scan the rest of the table, and we're going to be here a while. So in that circumstance, when you're looking at something like a GC process, um, think about what is going to happen and how it's going to perform when, there, when there's not a full batch of data left, and test for that. Um, test your batch size as well. Uh, one of the trickier things I've worked on wasn't the garbage collection process. It's basically a report. It's a really large report that we run against uh, data in our OLTP databases. And sometimes this report may return five rows, and sometimes it may return a couple million. And this was something that we needed to batch. And in testing that process, I, I wasn't sure what the batch size was going to be, and I thought maybe it'd be you know, 100 or 1,000, but I tested it out, and I tested it with 100, and I tested it with 500, 1,000, and I keep, kept going up. And I found that, you know, the 1,000 batch size took, a, took twice as long as the 100 batch size. But of course, we got 10 times as much work done, so that's, it was more efficient. So 
I checked 10,000. I checked 100,000. I actually ended up surprisingly with a batch size of 10,000 for this report process because it, it performed better per row that was being returned, if that makes sense. And that wasn't what I expected at all, but I'll, I'll take whatever gain I can get. But, you know, test your batch size. You might be surprised at what works. Um, and parameterize things. Um, I like having the batch size and how long I want it to loop uh, in my procedures as input variables so that whatever process I'm calling, uh, if I have an agent job calling it, I could just, you know, update the agent job and say, okay, we've got, we know we've got a lot more data in this table that needs to be GC'd. Why don't I tell it to run for uh, a larger batch size or why don't I tell it to run for 60 seconds at a time instead of 30? Um, having it parameterized gives us a way to adjust those things easily. So let me look at a more uh, complex garbage collection process. So here's the orders table in worldwide importers. I'm writing this as a stored procedure. I'm turning off no count. I'm detecting whether or not there's a nested transaction because actually when I'm in, going to invoke this later on, I'm going to, again, I'm going to call a procedure, but I'm going to wrap it in a transaction uh, so that I can roll it back and keep my, uh, my, uh, keep my test environment how I expect it to look. So I've got a batch size, I've got a duration. Um, I'm going to, I can't just look at the orders table, find things and delete them because we have foreign keys set up. So what I need to do is identify what order IDs I'm going to be getting rid of and then delete it from all the tables that are dependent. So I'm using a uh, temp table for the orders table itself so I can put all the order IDs into it. I'm actually using a second one because the invoices table depends on the orders table and there are more things that have a foreign key pointed to invoices. So I've got two temp tables here so I can store that information before I delete it. I calculate my end time based on the duration that was passed in. And my while loop is until we hit that end time, I'm gonna truncate my temp tables. I'm going to go into the orders table and I'm going to find orders that are older than 50 months old. And that should be everything in here. Uh, I'm going to do a batch of whatever the batch size is passed in. Uh, by default, it's 100. I'm going to put that into my temp table. So I'm going to have a temp table full of my order IDs. Then I'm going to join that temp table to the order lines table. And I'm going to delete all my order lines that are based on that order ID. Then I'm going to go to the invoices table. And I'm going to join that to my temp table. And I'm going to identify the invoice IDs I'm going to delete and then put them in my second temp table. You might notice right here, uh, my delete here doesn't have a top clause on it, and neither does my invoice, although you can see I actually wrote it in there, and I thought it was funny, so I just commented and left it there. Um, we don't really need to batch anything. Everything is controlled by how large the batch size is for our orders, and we don't want to limit other things. Our, uh, our 100 orders might have a lot more than 100 order lines, and we can't delete our orders until all of our order lines are gone. So we, we can't really control our batch size here. We control it here and everything else is a, is a multiple of what that original batch size is. And it's the same for invoices. I think our relationship here between invoices and orders is one to one, but we don't want to delete some of the related invoices. We have to get rid of all of them if we're going to get rid of, if we're going to actually delete these old orders. So put that information in a temp table. Then the from the invoices temp table, I'm going to delete records from customer transactions, stock item transactions, and invoice lines. Once they're all deleted, I can go back and delete from my invoices table, and then I can delete from my orders table. So having to work backwards there. And at that point, I can uh, commit my transaction and I'm done. And we will continue looping at that point as long as we've got time remaining. Questions about that so far? Uh, no questions yet. But might help see. if I actually hit Control M before I tell it to run back. What were you saying? No questions yet, but there's still plenty of time for people to type. Okay. So I've got this running a loop just for five seconds. 
and let's take a look at our execution plan. So, okay, we have a constant scan here and it's getting one row. Well, what it's really doing in that constant scan is it's actually doing the calculation to figure out our date map so that we can compare it to our order date. Uh, then we try this again. Okay. Then we go into our index seek. We have an index that we're using here. We only read 100 rows. We return the 100 rows. It goes through our nested loops and our top operator, and everything looks wonderful here. And actually, this is another thing you probably will see, or you should be seeing if things are going well. The most expensive thing here is actually the insert itself for us inserting into our table, into our, our temp tape. That's a lot more expensive than our seek, but that's what you'd expect. Operate, uh, actual DML operation is going to be more expensive uh, in most cases. That's why it threw me off a little bit earlier when I saw our delete against our in-memory table was really small, but that's in-memory, so that's different. So let's see what else we've got here. Um, if I look through our other operations, we delete from our first table. We can actually see here we delete more than 100 rows. That's fine. Our 100 orders, we had 215 order lines. We actually do a hash match. Now that's, we do a hash match aggregate. Well, that's not great, but we're still only returning uh, the number of rows we'd expect. We're doing table scans against the temp table, but that really doesn't bother me because we know the batch size is reasonable. We're only getting 100 rows. And um, and we're, we're using the temp table first and then joining to the second table afterwards. So we haven't had any problems with that yet. Looking here, we're populating the invoices table. And it is a one-to-one -one relationship. So we're only get a, getting 100 invoices to go with our 100 orders. We delete from our other tables. And it looks like there, we've got 100 records from customer transactions. We've got a couple hundred against the stock item transactions. And then we hit invoice lines, which is 215 more. And then we get down to Something that looks really, really strange here, if you haven't seen it before. We're actually deleting from the invoices table, and our execution plan is a lot bigger than anything else here. So what's going on? We're, come on, behave, okay. Excuse me a moment, I need more real estate. Ah, okay. So we're starting off here, we're doing, we're hitting our temp table, we're joining two invoices, we join this, we sort it, why are we sorting it? That's an interesting thing, we're sorting it by the invoice ID. Okay, we hit our delete operation, we delete 100 rows, everything's fine up until now, but now we're doing nested loops and we're hitting the customer transaction table and we're hitting the invoice line table and we're hitting the stock item transaction table, but well, we've already deleted records from them, right? So why is it doing it? Well, it's doing it because there's a foreign key on each of those tables. And you know that we've deleted all that data and I know we've deleted all that data, but SQL Server doesn't know that and it's gonna go and verify regardless. So it's gotta go and do each of these lookups to make sure that we're not violating the foreign key by deleting, by deleting an invoice that these things depend on. So this is expected, this makes sense. Um, we've got good indexes supporting each one of these, so it doesn't come back to haunt us. But if we didn't have indexes, we would probably find out about it in a hurry. Um, this assert operator is also kind of, uh, is part of the verification of the foreign keys. If any of these things had returned rows, we would fail the operation at this point. So that's us deleting from the invoices table. And underneath that, we've got We've got our operation against the orders table, and we've got kind of more of the same here. We've got 100 rows. Uh, we pass that through. I'm not sure why I'm seeing these sort operators. I don't think I've seen these before. Um, it's sorting them based on the order ID table. I think it's trying to get it in. We're trying to put the this 100 rows in the same order it is on the table so we can do the delete. But I haven't seen that previously. Um, 
but we're still just getting 100 rows through our operation. We go through, we validate our foreign key on order lines and invoices, and we actually have a foreign key as well on the on the sales table referencing itself. Uh, you can see a fat line here because it's estimating that it's going to be returning a lot of rows, but it actually finds none. So that's misleading, but estimates can be off sometime, and in this case, they are way off. So um, our delete operations seem to be performing well. Uh, we've got a reasonable number of, we've got an expected number of rows everywhere. Um, and if you keep looking, uh, we had this running for five seconds. That's eight execution plans we've been through. Um, there's quite a few more because it loops a couple more times. Any questions about my GC process here? Looks like none well, yet. Okay. So a couple thoughts here. So A, I've already mentioned the idea that you, you, you might accidentally be tempted to put in another top operator here, but you would, you would probably be getting some failures uh, depending on the, the cardinality of the tables if you were to do that. One of the things to think about, and I mentioned it a couple steps ago, is transact as necessary. And you can legitimately, depending on the relationship of your tables and how you know whatever app is based on them operates, you could legitimately ask the question of whether you even need a transaction here. So follow me for a second. Let's say we go, we identify our orders, we delete the order lines, we identify our invoices, we delete the customer transactions, we delete the stock item transaction. And then when we go to delete the invoice lines, let's say there's a deadlock, there's a hiccup on the server, something weird happens, and we hit an error. Um, well, we're in a transaction right now, so that's going to get rolled back, and we're going to undelete the stock item transactions and undelete the customer transactions and undelete the order lines. And so next time we run it, we're going to have to delete all that stuff again. And it may seem like not much of anything to do, but you can legitimately ask the question whether you want to undo the data in that circumstance. And it depends. Like I said, it depends on uh, if your application is going to look at this and say, oh, wait a minute. There are invoice lines here that go to an invoice that doesn't have any transaction. I don't know what to do anymore. If that's if if all of this needs to be lockstep with each other for the app to make sense, then then by all means put a transaction around it. But otherwise, you might well decide ah, if we delete part of this data and then something weird happens, the next time we run it, it's going to identify the same orders because the orders didn't get cleaned out yet, and we'll try to delete all the bits that go along with, but they'll be less to do. So you can decide sometimes whether or not it actually makes sense for you to have a transaction uh, in your operation. And if it's a very simple, uh, like one of our earlier examples that was just deleting from one table, um, well, it seems kind of pointless. But it's something to bear in mind that there may be circumstances that you'd want to go one way or the other with that. Um, so that's a more comprehensive garbage collection process. We cleaned out data from six different tables all at one time. Um, and we were able to get out several loops of that in five seconds. So what's next? Um, I've been mainly talking about deleting data, um, but kind of the, the top operator and batching operations isn't just for that. Um, it also is important for updates. And the thing that I've mainly used it for is personally identifiable information. You may have places where you need to anonymize or obfuscate data so we're not actually deleting the rows, but we may have something that's sensitive that we need to change, we need to anonymize, and so we're gonna be running update operations. And it's a little bit different for a couple of things, so I've got uh, an example or two for that. So let me go ahead and pull that up. So what I'm gonna to want to do is I'm gonna to wanna to loop through and I'm gonna to wanna to anonymize data out of the invoices table and what I'm doing. So I've decided I want to anonymize data. There weren't a lot of great examples in this database. I poked around a bit. So I looked at one, um, mainly in anonymizing data, I was looking for kind of character-based data. You're looking for you know VAR cards, you're looking for names, you're looking for phone numbers or email addresses or things like that, which are all typically going to be stored in character fields. Um, I was looking at this one, and delivery instructions was one that kind of caught my attention. 
Because um, sometimes data can, uh, sometimes you can have data that's stored in weird places that's actually provided directly from the customers. For example, um, if you've bought presents for someone on Amazon, you may, uh, especially around Christmas time, it'll ask you whether this is a gift. And if it's a gift, you can leave a note for someone. And that gift might be to my dear wife named such and such. I love you very much. Sincerely, Jared. And if you do that, you've now got names in that field. And whether it amounts to anything that's useful for someone or not, to me, it bears to be, it, 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 it's worthwhile to be suspicious of anything like that that could have been provided from somebody outside your system. So I looked at this one and I said, huh, this is something that I might make sure I go and anonymize just to make sure there's not something useful in that field. And like I said, there weren't email addresses in this database, so I had to go find what I could find. So I'm looking for things, I'm looking for rows, and I've just got a select statement here so I can kind of see execution plans and see what's working. Um, and, okay, can't drop that, hold on a second. I'm gonna create an index on this real quick. And I wanted to create a, a simple query against this, and I'm looking for things that are more than 90 days old, where the delivery instructions are not already known. Now this is a nullable field, so I can just set it to null later on if I want to. But let me go find uh, a thousand rows and see what my execution plan looks like. So I am going to run this, and we're going to see that it's basically horrible. We, okay, my batch size is a thousand here, but we're doing a index scan, which isn't great. Um, I just created an index on this actually. I created an index based on last edited when. So this is the main thing we're using in our where clause, but it chose not to use that index. So if we look at the operator, haha, if we look at the operator, um, we only read a thousand rows, so it, it's not terrible, but we did do the clustered index scan instead of doing the index seek. And remember that thing I said about testing the negative? If it didn't find a thousand rows, it would have just kept reading. We might have been here all day. So why is it that we were doing that? Um, and it estimated that we would read 151,000 rows here. Well, the idea is we're filtering on two things and only one of them is in the index. Now, delivery instructions is a VARCAR max field. So we can't actually put this in, the, in as a key value in our index. But SQL Server obviously decided, well, if I've got to use the index, and then I've got to go do a bookmark lookup. Oh, well, that's way too expensive. I'm not going to do a bookmark lookup. I'm just going to scan the primary. I'm just going to scan the PK and index. And that'll be much better. It'll be much better until we can't find a thousand rows really quickly. So if I go back and I change my index to include delivery instructions, we'll end up with a much happier execution plan because we won't be having that scan anymore. Okay, we're doing our date math. And then we come down and we do an index seek the second time. And we still only read a thousand rows, but we're not doing the index, we're not doing the clustered index scan. And so on the back side, once this operation has caught up and we don't have uh, much data or we don't have any data that needs to be anonymized, the next time we run it, it's not gonna scan the whole table. So we're thinking forward a little bit. All right, so we've got a select that works here. So I'm gonna go through a little example. There's one problem with updates that you don't get with, that you don't get with delete operations. So I'm gonna run through, uh, here's my setup for that. I'm gonna tell this thing to go and delete batches of a thousand rows from our invoices table with the criteria we just created and with the index with our included columns on it. So that's gonna be great. And I'm keeping track in this type case, I'm not timing it. I'm telling it, keep going until you deleted 50,000 rows. Which actually would not be great if there aren't 50,000 to delete, but haha, uh, we definitely have that many delete. Let me, let me show you the example of this real quick. So I'm gonna run this, I'm gonna have it delete 50,000 rows. It's not gonna take very long, actually. It took one second, that's great. Look at how good we are. So now I wanna show you what happens when we do the next batch. So we're doing batches of a thousand, right? So let's do just one more and I will get the execution plan, right? Right. 
that I highlighted? Okay, all right. So, hmm, what's going on there? Just said we returned 51,000 rows from our index seek. Okay, we're doing our date math up here, but we're we're even using the right index. We're using the index we just we just created, but it's returning 51,000 rows. Well, what that is about is a snarky comment I had in my uh, I had in my presentation here. Progressively slower, and I I had the thought in my head that updates are not self-cleaning. So what's happening here is well, we deleted the 50,000 rows, one batch at a time, one batch at a time. Well, we didn't delete them. No, we were anonymizing data. So we went and found rows that are old, that have delivery instructions, and we nulled out the delivery instructions. But, but that's in the where clause. We're, on, we're looking for our next rows. We're looking for rows where the delivery instructions are not null. Well, the problem is, our index was based on last edited win, and those rows that we updated are still in our index. So the 50,000 rows we've already anonymized are still there, and we're having to kind of read past all the data we've already updated to get to the next batch of rows that we're going to anonymize. So we, we just, every time we run this batch, it gets a little bit slower than it was last time, and it's gonna get progressively worse. We're not deleting those rows. In a, in a garbage collection process, you find your thousand rows, you delete them. They're no longer in your way. But if you're doing something where you're updating data in a batch like this, you, you kind of need to take some step to make sure that you're not having to go back over uh, freshly trodden ground. And in this case, we're, we're redoing this way, same work. At least we're having to read past those rows every time. So how could we, how could we improve on this? Well, my thought was, to me, it was obvious we need to have a filtered index. Now, I've done the same thing uh, for anonymization process that I wrote, and it works really, really well. Because what I've done here is I've taken the same index, and it still includes the delivery instructions table. We can't put it in the key because it's an NVARCAR max field. But we can add it, have it as an included column, and now if we add it as a filter on our index, are you really taking that long? Oh yeah, never mind. I've got an open transaction against that table. That might be a problem. If I add a, if I add a filter on my index so that the only rows in this index are ones where the delivery instructions haven't been nulled yet, then the next time I run this query, the first, the first thousand rows I look at should all be things that I want to operate. So let's back up one more step. I'm gonna run the loop again and go ahead and operate on a fresh 50,000 rows and then see what our update looks like afterwards. So it's getting execution plans for all those loops. This is gonna take just a moment. Okay. So if I comment these rows out and I go back and show you our 51st batch, the plan shows what? <laughs> okay, we still read 51,000 rows. Did we actually create that index or did it just get canceled? Hold on. Something has to go, something has to go sideways when you're doing things live, right? Can't drop the index because it doesn't exist. Okay, so I should be able to create it and that should be great. So let's try this once more with feeling. I'm gonna do my first batch, or I'm gonna do my loop, and I'm gonna set this up, and it's gonna complete really quickly, and that's gonna be great. Okay, so we've got that done. Uh, it looks about right. So now if I go and see what our next batch looks like, we should have a nice clean thousand rows operated on. We only returned a thousand rows from our index seek, and we only had to read a thousand rows because everything in that index is something we care about, as long as it's in date. So if you're doing something like an anonymization process in, you know, in preparation, well, to comply with GDPR or CCPA or just general concerns, it's something to keep in mind where you're doing updates 
as opposed to deletes. Questions? Yeah, would you mind popping back to that index for just? Popping back to the index. Yeah. Yes. One thing to that I want to emphasize here, because I've run into the problem before, is that delivery instructions, which is part of the filter, really needs to be part of the index or the include. So I think I saw a post from you recently. When did when did you you posted something about that recently? I don't think I posted about it. Actually, it was a Jira ticket. Uh, it's something I will have to post about. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. There's a sprint review item. Yeah. So what's happening okay. here? is that especially if you say where delivery instructions is null, so if you flip the scenario around and you're only caring about something where it is null, you would think that the filter doesn't matter. And if my predicate has where delivery instructions is null, then you know, the index should work. But if the column is not part of the include, and in this case, it would just be null for every row, then the Op, the database engine cannot use that index to get the delivery instructions value of null. So just make sure when you do this, your filters, your predicates are index columns, whether they be in the top level or in the include section. And and your thing that you ran into was specifically where the delivery instructions were is null, right? Correct. And in that case, I did okay. not even. I could remember. It. I would have gotten it backwards. Yeah, I didn't put it in the include section because, well, it's it is null. Like, you know what it is? It's null. <laughs> it's not a mystery. Yeah, but it's it gets confused. So, just wanted to lay that out for everybody. Solomon's run into that as well. Yeah, it's it's a problem, mm. an intricacy around uh, filtered indexes. All right. So another another reason why we should you know put together some queries and test our things and see how things work and. And, and do all of our due diligence. Um, and so I think that's all I had for on the subject of update process. Um, and filtered indexes, I've, I've gotten a lot more fond of filtered indexes over the last year uh, from, from this process and a couple of other things. Um, they can be highly efficient, so I'm a big fan. Um, and uh, I guess there's one more thing I should mention, even though it's not on my notes. And it applies to the garbage collection processes and the updates. So, so either in this in this area, I'm a big fan of stability. Um, I, was, I was in a uh, I was in a free session. I think Brent Ozar did a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about some aspect of performance optimization and the subject of like index hints. I think came up, and he was he was talking. He, he was basically saying that he's not a fan of hints. I'm becoming a huge fan of hints, and let me tell you why. Um, in, in a lot of the garbage collection processes I looked at, there weren't actually temp tables in them. There were table variables in them. And there's reasons for that. But the disadvantage with table variables is that SQL Server doesn't have stats on them. So it doesn't know if that table variable has 10 rows or 10 million. And sometimes that lack of information means it makes bad decisions. And so what we would see uh, when you're using a table variable, and let me go back and find my earlier GC process. What you might find in that circumstance is that instead of this statement operating in the way it's written, SQL Server might instead decide, oh, well, if I'm going to have to read everything in one of these two tables, either my table variable or the real table, maybe I'll just scan order lines today. That sounds like fun. I'll scan order lines and then I'll join it to orders the orders GC table variable and realized there were only 100 rows in there to begin with. Oops. And so um, to deal with that and some, and some other issues with statistics or with plans uh, being different on one day on a given database than most of the time everywhere else, I've, I've really gotten to be kind of a big fan of using index hints and join hints. So if I find that this behavior, that this, that this query goes sideways on some of my big databases, I could either put an index hint on, well, I could put an index hint if that would help me to, to edge it towards one or the other. So in this case, I could do an index hint here, getting it to uh, use the index based on order ID, or more likely, 
I would just tell it to do an inner loop join, which has the which has the effect of chain of locking down my join order. I've just told it use the table variable and then inner loop join to this. This is table A and this is table B. Do them in that order. Thank you. Uh, and it works. And SQL Optimizer will do it in that order. So I don't even. I, I, so I didn't mention in my in my uh, slides here, uh, but I have used uh, index hints or uh, join hints very often to get the behavior to be what I want it to be, to get it to join things in a specific order, or to get it to use the the correct in, the correct index on the first table. And to me, that that solves a lot of uh, that that gets rid of a lot of headaches for me. And I don't do it willy nilly, but you know, it's it's better that than me to have to spend all afternoon figuring out why my garbage collection process went uh, be, went slow on database 100. So I'm a big fan of consistency. Um, there's one more example, and this has actually come up at work once recently, um, just as a topic of conversation, but. If you're doing garbage collection, anonymization, anything else similar that's based on a date, well, you're going to be doing inequality searches, inequality comparisons. You're going to, you're, you're never going to be looking for an exact date. You're going to be looking for a range of dates. Some, you know, every, everything before, you know, January of last year. That's the kind of search you're going to be looking for. And there's a weird problem that can crop up with how SQL Server estimates things. And I wanted to give you uh, an, uh, an idea of what that looks like. So here is my example. So I'm looking at orders. I'm looking at them just based on date. And I'm saying, I want to, I'm actually just counting here. I wanted to see how many things are older than the archive date, which I've calculated to be 70 months in the past. Big number. So uh, I want to sum up how many rows are within that date range, that very old date range. So let's let me get the plan. Oh, when I get the plan, and I want to run my query. And okay, there's 30,000 rows in that date range. Great. Um, if I look at the execution plan, let's go to the videotape. Um, okay, we, what did we say? That returned 30,651. Okay, so we've got an operation here, and I can see. Uh, it actually number of actual number of rows is thirty thousand seven hundred three, so it's a little bit off, um, but it's really close. And we can see my seek predicate down here. We're comparing the order date to a scalar operator, and that's our bit of date math we did. And our estimate is very close here. Our estimate is at ninety nine percent. So um, the 30,703 is the number of rows the SQL returned, and the 30,742 is what SQL Server estimated based on statistics. So, okay, straightforward, nothing weird here so far. Now, what if I change my where clause here? Now, what if I change, so I had calculated the archive date. What if I just put that in as my comparison? We get something that's a little different, and it may bite you, and it may not. The number of rows within date, still the same. But if I go to the execution plan, you'll notice that the estimate is different. Why is the estimate different? It's saying before the actual number of rows and what we return and what we estimated was quite close. But now it's a bit further off. Now it's saying 47,630. That's how many it expected us to return from our operation. So what just happened? Well, what just happened was here we're calculating something live and kind of the optimizer's, optimizer is able to take full advantage of the number that we calculate. And it's able to take that number and compare it to the statistics on the table and say, okay, here's the date I've got that I'm comparing against. How much falls in the little bucket ahead of that? And it comes up with a good estimate. Here, we calculate it, stuff it in a variable. And SQL Server's kind of blind to the contents of that variable. It doesn't know what's there. So it kind of makes a guess. And the guess is horrible. Um, it doesn't have any statistics to tell it how much of the table. It can't probe that variable value. 
So it just says, eh, inequality search, 30% of the table. Blind, silly guess. And in this case, it's not terrible, but you know, it's it's off. And down here, let me run this real quick. I counted all the rows in the table, 158,000, and I calculated what 30% of all of the rows in the table is, and it's 47,636. And that sounds really familiar because that was in our execution plan a moment ago. SQL Server estimated we'd have that many rows. And you know, so why do we care the estimates off? Well, the estimate off could be the difference between it deciding to do a table scan and doing a seek. And if we're doing a scan, that really might affect the outcome of our top operation, especially if there aren't 100 rows for us to find. We go looking through the entirety of the rest of the table to find it. Or because SQL Server says, oh, we're going to be returning more rows, we're going to be returning a third of the table, why don't we do a hash match instead of nested loops? Now you're building a hash table again, and that's going to be a lot slower. So there's a couple of circumstances that a bad estimate could cause SQL Server to make bad decisions. Not guaranteed, but it's something to be aware of. And in this case, the difference is this happens because I've got a really simple criteria here. If I was doing anything more complicated, it'd be a lot, it'd be a lot harder for me to kind of back SQL Server into making this decision. But Given these two coding patterns, you're better off doing this one and having the actual date calculated live for this inequality search because SQL Server can understand how many records uh, are going to fall outside of that range. If I back this up a bit more, we'd probably get still an accurate estimate. How many rows did we get? Oh, we didn't get any. Oh, look, our estimate said zero of 150, but it's still pretty darn close. And it helps SQL Server to decide what kind of execution plan is going to be appropriate for this. And we're doing a nested loop store because it's not that many rows. Um, so this is just a weird thing that popped in my head. And it could be relevant to us because if we're doing date-based queries, we're going to be doing inequality queries. Um, and one last thing, if you do have an inequality and you're filtering on, say, multiple columns, Uh, if we had, say, an order status and we're only interested in things that are in a completed status, our order is 100% complete. If you had a complex thing like this, always make sure that your inequality is not the leading field. It should be the last one because it basically, once SQL Server is to the point of doing a range scan in an index, it can't use additional columns beyond that, which is something else that may come up. Uh, if you're doing this kind of work. Last chance for questions. You could no, always tweet them to me later if you come up with something brilliant. <laughs> uh, so there is a question. Would you put changes like date add in the join filter? Would that make any difference? Changes like date add. Um, so I, I'm not, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Changes like date add. Yeah, I'm not positive either. Um, let's we'll see if, uh, Raymond, if you could, um, clarify just a little bit. Solomon and I have been talking a bit more about filtered indexes and the weirdness of criteria. Anders mentions that index hints are great until the jerk of a DBA drops the index. <laughs> that is a good one. That is a good one. Um, if you do use index hints and something happens to the index, if it gets dropped, if it gets anything happens, if that index goes away, your procedure has is now dead in the water until you update your procedure. Yeah. Or rebuild your index. So your example, placing a table, the so placing a table A, right join table B on A dot date equals B dot date, and A dot date is okay. less than or equal to date add. Okay. Well, if I had a well, if I had a where cause here, um, let's say it would be unnecessary in this case, but I guess maybe if I was saying where the 
there's probably some kind of date field on this order lines table where last edited or um, picking completed when. Um, I suppose you may have a circumstance where you have multiple criteria like this. Now, if you had this, you might end up with a circumstance where a SQL Server might very easily say, oh, he's got a date clause on this thing here. Let me start by searching the order lines table based on this date field. It might decide to go in that order because really the way you've written the query is, is not much more than a suggestion to SQL Server. It, it decides it's going to do it in reverse order or if it's going it, to, it, it'll join them however it decides it needs to, to get the best performance that it can you know, in estimating this within a reasonable time frame. But if you had an additional criteria here based on uh, something from the order lines table, it might very well decide to take as if and run with it rather than joining to the very simple temp table that we know is not going to have more than 100 rows. This criteria might have a lot more than 100 rows. So this would be one where um, having your inner join, your inner loops join here might be beneficial. But he was mentioning a right join, wasn't he? Yeah, but I think that was just hypothetical. Um, if you had, say, a left join or a right join, um, that would also, it would depend on the circumstances, and I don't have a great example for that. Um, I can't think of an, you know, I, I can't think of a circumstance if you were using, say, a temp table like this, where you'd be left joining to another table. Um, in this case, so in this like, case, there is a difference with that where clause because now you're saying sole dot picking completed win must be not null. So that's right. essentially you've made this into a, a secret inner join. Yes, I have made it made it a secret inner join. It'll say it'll it won't find anything. Um, if the data is right, but it's, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not saying that correctly, but, but yes, uh, we've, we've effectively made it an inner join because we have to have a real value coming back from order lines for that to be the case. Right. So then if you didn't want that, uh, you would change it to an and sold out picking completed win instead of a where clause so that now it's part of the join criteria, meaning that you'll get back DC records and anything joined to order lines if the order ID matches and the picking completed is more than 50 months ago. Correct. Um, I'm not sure how, it, how uh, and I'm not sure whether having the second criteria would affect the plan much in that case, because I think it would have to, um, well, it would, it would be, a, this is a weird example anyway, because we're deleting from a table that's the left on the left, that, that's the outer uh, join part of the, of this query. So I'm, I'm not sure how it, would, how it would attempt to come up with a plan for this, but I think it would still start with the temp table because if this is outer and there's no record, then it can't effectively search for this still. So yeah, so I think it would still operate like an inner join. So uh, next question is, when using the variable in the where clause, I was expecting the execution plan to use an average of that field from the stats header. You showed that it uses a percentage? It uses a percentage of the rows in the table. So this query down here, I'm counting all the rows in the orders table with, with no criteria, no filter whatsoever. There's 158,000 rows in this table. And then I calculate, I said, okay, same thing, count one, all rows, multiply that by 0.3. So multiply that by 30%. That is my wild guess field. So if SQL Server has an inequality and it doesn't know what to do about it, and you probably couldn't have seen this anyway because it's really, really small. Total number of rows is 158,000. My wild guess, or SQL Server's wild guess when it doesn't have statistics to work with and you're doing an inequality on this table and it doesn't know what to think, it says 30% eh, of the table would be 47,000 rows. And that's when we were doing an inequality and we were using a variable that doesn't have any statistics. So, and to go back to that, that's the, that's the default estimate that SQL makes. And it's not based on like the statistics for the table. It's really not a terribly clever wild guess 
It is 30% of the number of rows in the table. And this is when there's no stats available. I got a couple links here. Um, I think they were two uh, blog posts. Yeah, that's SQL Shack. And I think this one might be SQL Central, Central or something. So um, if I put these uh, slides somewhere you can see them, you can go take a look at those links or you can do some searching for it yourself. You will find if you search for, you know, inequality 30% estimate SQL Server, you will find hits. You will find quite a few of them. Okay. If there are any other questions, probably your best opportunity, except for all the previous opportunities, drop them in chat. Make sure that I'm not seeing any that came in earlier, but I'm pretty sure, yep, we're caught up on questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Absolutely, yeah, so I think this is, uh, this was very helpful, thank you. Although not a question, I'm sure Jared appreciates that very much. You're getting many <laughs> non-questions that are thanking you for your presentation. There's a loud group of people clapping. You just can't hear them because your window's shut. <laughs> well, I hope people, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure some of this is going to seem quite simple to the, the Solomons and the Anders, but I swear I had never heard the term blocking operator until uh, Grant mentioned in his conversation with us last year, and I was just flummoxed by the oddness of that. I, I, uh, I find it frustrating and amusing sometimes how much there is still to learn when it comes to the SQL Server Optimizer. So hopefully I've helped some other people with that. So the question uh, did come in, will slides be available? Um, sure, I just gotta figure out where we're gonna put them. Um, is there some place that I could put them that people would see them through uh, the group or should I just like zip up something and tweet it out or what? Yeah, so if you've posted it to your website, then give me a link and we can put it on I was going to say, I could put it on my blog. That'll okay. Work. I'll put it up on my blog and it'll be there tonight. Excellent. So there you go. And I'll make sure that my scripts, all my little cute tests against the Wide World Importers database are there as well. So you can grab it all at once. All right. So with have a good night, that, everybody. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, everybody, for attending this evening's session of the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group. Bye. I keep pushing this. This is probably going to be the last time that I can really push it because it'd be awkward if I had this uh, promo next week after the event happens. So I gotta, I gotta milk this for what it's worth. It, it took me literally minutes, well, minute to come up with this promo. So I gotta, I gotta use it uh, as much as I can. So Data Architecture Day this Saturday, check it out, meetup.com slash tripass. And until next time, everybody have a wonderful evening.